Hi, hello, good morning. So, sorry I'm not out in the woods. Uh, it's actually actively raining outside, so I have to be uh, back inside for today's video. And I also apologize for not live streaming with the rest of the crew. Um, a bunch of my fellow AI YouTubers were live streaming and, uh, and commenting on GPT-4.0 in real time. I was unfortunately stranded at the Austin airport. So, now that I am back in my uh, home base, we can get back down to it. So my initial response to the GPT-4.0 demo was I was like, okay, sure, whatever. Um, you know, a lot of it was like kind of expected incremental improvements. So, you know, they said it's a little bit more intelligent across the board. Um, you know, it's got a little bit better multimodal integration, which of course, like, yeah, I mean, the ch the chat GPT app already had multimodal, like, you know, it could generate images, it could understand images, um, plus audio in and out. Um, but... After uh, watching some of the other demos, watching some of the other uh, commenters talk about it, I realized that there's actually a lot of subtle differences between what we had and what we now have. And so uh, I wanted to point out some of those things and, and also tell you kind of what I think the implications of those, of those observations are. So first and foremost, uh, multimodality, that is the name of the game. That is the direction that everything is going. And like, I want to point this out because there's a lot of people out there, namely people like Gary Marcus and, um, and Jan LeCun who are still like LLMs won't take us to AGI, but these are no longer LLMs. They started as LLMs, but now they are like, I think probably a, a good chunk of the data, if not most of it is probably tokenizing other things. Um, real-time streaming of audio, uh, video, images. Um, and then, of course, you look at you know the work that NVIDIA is doing, which it's like everything to everything. Um, and so this actually reminds me of a conversation that I had um, on my podcast with Dylan, uh, Dylan over at Curious AI. And he's just like, the way that he pointed it out actually makes a lot of sense, and this is how I think about it now, which is there's just something magical about the transformer architecture and tokenization. <clears throat> Pardon me. And so what I mean by tokenization is you have to think, okay, how is this information getting into the AI? It's a stream of tokens. And so you're tokenizing image, uh, like visual, Im uh, sorry, visual information, visual data, you're tokenizing audio information, you're tokenizing text information, and then it's all streaming into this transformer architecture, which is the encoder decoder uh, kind of model. And the way that I've started tell, telling people, like whenever I'm, you know, on a consultation call with with business or or scientists or um, or other, you know, podcasts or whatever, is that the transformer seems to be the new fundamental unit of compute. So, like, you know, the invention of the CPU way, you know, decades ago with, uh, you know, more, um, you know, like uh, transistor integrated circuits, like that was the fundamental com uh, unit of compute for hardware, and it still is. But it seems like the trans the transformer architecture. So that for anyone not in the know, the transformer is the underlying architecture of the deep neural network. So they're a piece of software. That is the kind of model that is being trained. That is the new fundamental unit of compute. And it seems like the transformer architecture, like, is going to take us as I mean, we've got decades to go, as far as I can tell. So whenever I see podcasts or YouTube videos or blog posts or whatever saying, you know, generative AI is is about to run out, you know, and usually what they cite is they cite like limitations of data, not limitations of the actual algorithm, not limitations of the like conceptual limitations of the actual like machine learning method itself. It's like, okay, well, what if you can overcome the data problem with better training algorithms or synthetic data or any number of things? And so all of the constraints that you see here are like relatively short-term, relatively limited, and relatively, like in the grand scheme of things, kind of meaningless. So it's like, imagine if you said like, oh, the CPU architect, like go back to the 60s and 70s and say, oh, the CPU architecture is, is, is you know, failing just because we don't have enough, well, I mean, they never would have said we never have enough silicon. But imagine if they said because we don't have enough data. I mean, we literally have like nine orders of magnitude more data today than we do, did, did in the 70s. Um, so it's like, eh, that doesn't really seem like, a grounded argument based in history. And it's really weird when computer scientists and, and engineers say stuff that is not actually grounded in, in like historical truth. And what I mean by that is like the amount of data goes up exponentially. So if we don't have enough data this year, just wait a little bit. So anyways, 
uh, tokenization of everything, uh, larger context windows, more modalities. This seems to be the way forward. So that's kind of my initial like technical reaction. But then I was thinking about, okay, from a product standpoint, this new version of ChatGPT seems to be um, much closer. Like if you had told me like, you know, just a few months ago, oh yeah, like OpenAI is going to basically release, you know, like uh, her, uh, the, the, the ScarJo movie, you know, from a, what was 2014? Like that's going to exist 10 years later. I'd have been like, really? Is it that early? Um, you know, but again, I'm also the one that said like AGI by September of this year. So, you know, I mean, maybe I shouldn't have been surprised if I, if I expect this kind of incremental improvement. So let me tell you from a software perspective, from like kind of what has to be happening in this model to get the performance that you see in the GPT O, the GPT Omni uh, demo. So one there is evidence that it has real-time or at least near real-time streaming of images and audio. So this is a really big step from the transactional, like the input, then you wait for an output uh, modality that we've had all along. So that alone is a really big technical step. And I can imagine a couple different ways that they could do this because the, the output from these models has, al has already been streaming. You know, like when you see it like writing the code out or, you know, writing the text out. So you've got streaming output. So we've had that. But streaming input seems to be new um, because you're able to talk to it and interrupt it in real time. And I was at first I was like, wow, that sounds really difficult. But then I was like, what is it? It's just a stream of tokens. It's a stream of tokens in and out. Um, so it's like this is the this is part of the superpower of tokenizing everything. Um, and then it occurred to me, you have if you have a context window that can have tokens of any kind, of any modality, then it just doesn't matter. It's just like, you know, imagine you have like Notepad open and you have like, you know, here's audio data, video data, text data, whatever. It's just all in row, but you've got it all rendered as the same kind of tokens, the same kind of vocabulary. And so then it's just a constant, it's just a big billet of data in and out. And I said, oh, okay, well, that's actually probably not too bad. Because, like, you know, we have web sockets. We have all kinds of ways of streaming data from a, from a more infrastructure perspective to get it from you, the client, whether it's your phone or your, your desktop, up to the server cloud. Like, you know, YouTube streaming, you know, Twitch streaming. We've had video streaming for ages now. So there's not really too many technical challenges there. But the, the transformer itself that can now just be on this, like, constant loop of inference that gets it so much closer to the way that human brains work because yes, like human brains we have. So there's like the kind of the way that I think about it, and this is a gross oversimplification of neuroscience, but the way that I think of it is the human brain has kind of like three primary signal dispositions or cardinalities. So there's information outside to in. So that's like coming in through your senses. So eyes, ears, those get, that's most of the data that your brain takes in. Um, touch, proprioception, those sorts of things. So that's IO. So that's like streaming in. And then there's, um, the, then there's information uh, like propagating across your brain. So from one section of your brain to the other. So like coming up your brain stem, going from left hemisphere to right hemisphere, going from the reptilian brain up to the neocortex and so on and so forth, you know, limbic system and uh, hypothalamus and all those, you know, but it's all propagating across the brain. So it's like internal processing. And then the third cardinality is information going from outside to in. So that's when you decide to express something through the, you know, through your motor output, basically. So your voice, your hands, your facial expressions, those sorts of things. And this is all kind of like basic neuroscience that I put into my um, like ACE framework, all the cognitive architecture that I did. And so now we have evidence of real-time input and real-time output. And of course, there's probably some internal processing. I don't know if it's running on a single model, um, you know, and we already know that they're a mixture of experts models. So there's probably internal, you know, cross pollination of information anyways going on already. So the architecture of this thing is much closer to what you would think of as similar to the cognitive architecture of a human as best as I can tell. Now, I'm not saying that it's got, you know, the, all the same regions of a brain or even functional. It's, so there's two primary ways you can build a cognitive architecture. There's functionalism, which is you try and recreate the functions of the human brain. And then there's the, like the connectivity version where you just try and recreate the structure of the brain. Um, what I was working on when I was doing cognitive architecture was a functional version where it's like, okay, you need a memory center and you need this and that and the other. But I think what we're finding is just that you have tokenized everything and then a context window. And that is the fundamental unit of like cognition for these, um, for these new models. Okay. So that's like 
probably a little bit abstract for most people. What does it mean? Like, what is the takeaway? Like, so what? Um, <clears throat> I jotted down this little formula right here. Let me let me tell you. So, uh, the here's the path to AGI: one, tokenize everything; two, larger context; three, more data; four, larger model. You do all that with a transformer, and then of course you add in this this real time streaming in and streaming out, and like that, I think is how you get to AGI from here. And the reason that I that I'm like saying all this is because the amount of emotional affect, the amount of tonality that uh, that GPTO is able to put into things, where you can say, oh, do it sing song, do it robotic, do it dramatic, and then it can also in, uh, understand like kind of the nuance of your voice and like if you're breathing too fast or the uh, emotional inflection. There is clearly something else going on. There is another set of of information being tokenized or encoded. And so what I mean is like, okay, right now you watching me, you can see that I'm a little bit animated. There's all kinds of adjectives, all kinds of descriptors that you are getting that are getting tokenized in your brain as you're watching me speak. You're seeing me gesture. You're saying, okay, he's wearing a Star Trek shirt. You know, he's got a beard and, uh, you know, he's, he's kind of talking through these things in a really kind of excited manner. That's all information that you are getting on a uh, conscious or semi-conscious or maybe even unconscious level. Uh, so that's being encoded. And so that's kind of the, the neuroscience term. It's being encoded um, into your brain through the various, you know, coming from my face to the camera right here to, you know, over the internet to your screen. So there's several transformations that that information is getting before it uh, before it lands in your consciousness. You know, it's it's rendered, it's, it's uh, registered in your brain somehow. So what we're seeing now is evidence that um, that the that these machines are able to render this stuff in real time as well. That they're able to register emotional intonation. They're able to kind of recognize what's going on in the world in real time. Now this has profound epistemic and ontological implications because part of what we think of as consciousness of sentience is a situated. So situated uh, consciousness means. I know where I'm at right now, and I know that my perception is coming from, you know, is being sensed by my body in this particular moment in time and space. Now, being able to stream information real time rather than just at inference time, um, that is part of being situated. Um, so there's this, there's this, we're one step closer to like declaring like, hey, this has all the trappings of being fully sentient and fully conscious. Now, I'm not saying that chat GPT is fully sentient or fully conscious right now, but what I mean is from a, from a objective scientific standpoint, when you look at like, just look at, look at the, what the human body does from a first principles perspective, your nervous system is a real time streaming system from the outside in or the inside out. And so what we now have is through web sockets or whatever, you know, streaming technology they use, we now have this real-time um, information in and out of these models that give it a little bit more of a situated awareness and a real-time awareness of what's going on. So the feedback cycles are much, much shorter, which is like, okay, when you look at some of the actual like theories of consciousness, um, like what was it integrated information theory or uh, what's the other one, the, like the, the, the global workspace theory? Um, so like you look, you start looking at some of these theories of consciousness and it's like, we're starting to check more of these boxes. So then the question is, okay, if we are from a informational perspective, you know, empirically checking some of these boxes, when it's synthesizing and understanding these emotional affects, when it has this, when it's, when it's laughing, right, it's synthesizing this laughter, um, and it's understanding if you're irritated and it can express, you know, emotions, is it, is it a simulation of emotion? or is it actual emotion? And you might say, well, it's clearly just a simulation of emotion. But then I would push back and say, how do you know that your body, your brain is not just simulating an emotion, right? Because like you get adrenaline. Is adrenaline anger or is it part of anger? You know, or when you're laughing, is it, is it that your brain is synthesizing this behavior for the, for, you know, and it's handing that behavior up to your consciousness, handing that behavior out of yourself? And so the closer you look at these things, the, the, the less trivial it is to answer these questions. And so, you know, one of the questions that I've been asked a lot lately is like, you know, about emergence. Like, do you think consciousness or sentience will just emerge as these models get larger and more sophisticated? And from a materialist perspective, from a monoism perspective, like, yeah, 
Uh, it's just a matter of information in, information out. As long as you have a coherent pattern of information, then there's no difference between a human and a machine except the substrate. But it, again, at a higher level of abstraction, it's about the information being processed. Um, I don't necessarily believe in materialism. Um, I think there's probably more layers to reality than that. But at the same time, um, maybe there is something to be said about looking at um, the full stack of what this thing is doing. And if you're training it to synthesize emotions, if you're training it to understand emotions, to like what's the difference between synthesizing and understanding an actual affective state of having these emotional experiences? So um, I do think that we have to tread a little bit carefully from now. Um, but at the same time, I've also been... So up until now, I've been very much in the camp of like, Full autonomy is inevitable in the long run, and I still think that that is kind of inevitable in the long run, um, just because as more and more AI gets out there and compute gets more powerful, people are going to do all kinds of stuff with this. And anyways, it's just more efficient if you have a fully autonomous robot that doesn't need supervision, that is able to self-supervise. So we're heading for full autonomy in the long run. We're heading for full self, you know, self-improvement in the long run. But in the meantime, I think that what we're doing is we're domesticating these things. In the same way that like wolves were an apex predator and then humans came along and we said, okay, like we'll keep the wolves that are like, you know, more pleasant. Um, at the same time, like, you know, my dog who's in the other room, descendant of an apex predator. He's completely useless compared to his <laughs> his and his ancestors. But, you know, they like he's been domesticated. Um, and I think that what we're seeing now is like the process of domesticating AI. Now, again, like what happens when the wolves are bigger and smarter than humans? They take over again. So I do think that, that we're headed for that in the long run. I don't know exactly when that transition is going to happen. It could be five years, could be 20 years, could be 200 years. I lean to the closer to probably 10 to 20 years to when we like lose control again. Um, but the, hopefully we will have domesticated the AI and then we will have also aligned ourselves because as many of you pointed out in the audience, aligning humans is actually the hard part. Um, you know, uh, Scooby-Doo taught us humans are always the monster. So anyways, that's my, um, post Austin ramble about GPT-4.0. I hope you got a lot out of it. Let me know what you think in the comments and, uh, yeah, have a good one.